Hello students, welcome to EPG Partshala. I am Dr. Maimuna Akhtar from School of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Jamia Hamdard. Here we are discussing about the module fluorophores from paper atomic absorption spectroscopy. So students, let us see what we are going to learn in this module. First, we'll be discussing about definition of fluorophores that requirement of any chemical to be a fluorophore, their types, means types of fluorophobes, intrinsic and extrinsic fluorophobes, covalent, non-covalent types, their advantages, disadvantages, and their photostability of the fluorophores. So to start with the definition of a fluorophore, fluorophores are chemicals or dyes which are used to mark proteins, tissues, or cells for examination by fluorescence microscopy. These chemicals work by absorbing energy of a specific wavelength region referred to as excitation range and they re-emit the absorbed energy that they have absorbed during the process of excitation in another specific wavelength region which is known as emission range. And all these fluorophores are used in numerous biological studies. This is a generalized fluorophore spectra. It shows you an absorption peak of a fluorophore, which is blue in color, and the emission peak, which is red in color. So instruments are used which can isolate the emission and the absorption peaks and study the emission peaks of the compounds. The fluorophores contain number of aromatic groups combined or planar or cyclic molecules. The condition is they should have several pi bonds. They are used alone as a dye for staining of structure. They can be used as a probe or indicator for enzymes. That means you attach those chemicals to the enzyme or protein and then observe the emission spectra or uh, their activity. Generally, they are bonded covalently to micromolecules and serve as markers by inducing fluorescence. They can be used to stain cells, tissue enzymes, or even nucleic materials in a variety of analytical methods. That is fluorescent imaging and spectroscopy. The ideal fluorophore. An ideal fluorophore should be conveniently excitable without simultaneous excitation of the biological matrix. It should be easily detectable with conventional instrumentation, high molecular absorption coefficient, and quantum yield. It should have no solubility problems, that means it should be soluble in relevant buffers, cell culture media or body fluids. It should be stable under relevant conditions of experiment It should, and its availability of functional groups for site-specific labeling. The reported data about its photophysics should be available and availability in a reproducible quality. Fluorescence probes, an important area in fluorescence spectroscopy. Probes properties are used to derive the information from the experiment about the various biological materials or biological systems. pH sensitive probes are used to measure pH of biological or chemical systems. Probes with long excitation and emission wavelengths are used in tissues which display autofluorescence at short excitation wavelength. Types of fluorophores. So by now we are aware about what is a fluorophore. So they can be divided into various categories. There are broadly two categories of fluorophores. One is intrinsic and another is extrinsic. Intrinsic means fluorophores which have the property of fluorescence in their nature. And another is extrinsic, that means you add some agent so that they get fluorescence. In case of intrinsic fluorescence, it occurs naturally, like in aromatic amino acids, NADH, chlorophyll, green fluorescent proteins, or flavins. Whereas in case of extrinsic proteins, you can attach a fluorophore, an organic small molecule, to any molecule, and due to that, the fluorescence is generated. And you can study the spectral properties of the sample. For example, fluorescein is attached, or densyl chloride is attached, or rhodamine can be used to induce fluorescence in non-fluorescent substances. Intrinsic or natural fluorophores. 
natural fluorophores are substances or chemicals or biomolecules natural fluorescence in proteins comes from aromatic amino acids like tryptophan tyrosine phenylalanine structure 1 is structure of tryptophan structure 2 is structure of tyrosine and third is structure of phenylalanine this table shows you various parameters of aromatic amino acids for fluorescence recording in water at ph 7.4 the first column shows amino acid second is excitation wavelength in nanometers and third is emission wavelength in nanometers followed by bandwidth quantum yield and lifetime the tryptophan has 295 and 353 excitation and emission wavelength with a bandwidth of 60 nanometers quantum yield of 0.13 and lifetime of 3.1 nanoseconds the tyrosine has excitation wavelength of 275 and emission wavelength of 304 nanometers with a bandwidth of 34 nanometers quantum yield of 0.14 and lifetime 3.6 phenylalanine has excitation wavelength at 260 nanometers with emission wavelength at 282 with unknown bandwidth and quantum yield of 0.02 and the highest lifetime of 6.8 nanoseconds the two graphs show the absorption and emission spectra of fluorescent amino acids in water at ph 7.4 you can see the highest peak is of tryptophan that means the highest intensity followed by tyrosine and phenylalanine in absorption spectra whereas the emission spectra is contrary is slightly higher intensity compared to the absorption spectra therefore useful for measurement tryptophan has dominant uv absorption and emission in proteins due to indole nucleus you could see that from the graph the intensity of the tryptophan absorption is very high tyrosine has same quantum yield as tryptophan but its emission spectra is distributed narrowly on wavelength scale and phenylalanine fluorescence is observed only in case tyrosine and tryptophan are absent in sample an increase in tyrosine emission is observed as the denaturation of the protein takes place fluorescence due to tryptophan that means the fluorescence of proteins due to the presence of tryptophan tryptophan emission is also very sensitive to its local environment therefore it's used as a reporter for protein conformational changes changes in spectra of protein emission can be due to many factors like binding of ligand to protein 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 association or protein unfolding the average emission of a protein is function of exposure of tryptophan residue to aqueous medium fluorescence lifetime of tryptophan residue typically ranges from 1 to 6 nanoseconds the fluorescence can be quenched by iodide acrylamide or disulfide group or by nearby protonated histidine residue fluorescence due to enzyme cofactors enzyme cofactors are very often fluorescent in nature for example nadh it is very highly fluorescent and the fluorescence is due to reduced nicotinamide ring which is present in it the absorption and emission maxima of nadh are 340 and 460 nanometers respectively that means it absorbs at 340 nanometers whereas the light it gives back is of 460 nanometer wavelength the oxidized form of nadh is non fluorescent and it has a lifetime of 0.4 nanoseconds in aqueous buffer in solution it loses its fluorescence which may be due to collision which you can say it's deactivation process or stacking with adenine moiety or upon binding to protein the quantum yield of nadh increases by four folds and lifetime of the nadh fluorescence increases to about 1.2 nanoseconds this slide shows you the structure of nadh and fad we already know nadh is fluorescent in oxidized form whereas it's non fluorescent in reduced form fadh is also bright yellow in oxidized form fluorescence from nadh and fadh has been widely studied for their binding to proteins 
the binding of NADH to protein prevents fluorescence quenching, which results due to oxidation of nicotinamide by the adenine group. Both free NADPH and protein bound to NADH show emission spectra at 295 with high intensity of protein. When excited at 340 nanometer, only NADPH shows emission spectra with increase in intensity. From this spectra, you can see the absorption and emission spectra of enzyme cofactor NADH and FADH. The increase in intensity of NADPH fluorescence may be due to high quantum yield of NADPH as a result of energy transfer from tryptophan residue. It's also believed that this increase may be due to less quenching of bound NADH. This increased quantum yield has been used for binding study of proteins and NADH. The fluorescence emission increases linearly with concentration of NADH in unbound form. When NADH binds to protein, high increase in emission occurs initially, which is due to binding to protein. And once all the binding pockets of the protein are occupied, the emission intensity increases in proportion to concentration of unbound NADH. This slide shows you a structure of 17 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase with bound NADPH. B is emission spectra of 17 B HSD in presence of NADPH, and C is in absence of NADPH. From the two graphs, we can make out that absorption spectra is towards the shorter wavelength, whereas emission spectra is towards the longer wavelength. Pyridoxal phosphate is another compound which shows intrinsic fluorescence. The pyridoxal group is often coupled to lysine residue by aldehyde group. The absorption and emission maxima are dependent upon chemical structure of protein. That means, depending upon the protein, the absorption and emission spectra of pyridoxal phosphate varies. Its emission spectra is also affected by pH of the solution. Riboflavin and FAD. The riboflavin mononucleotide and flavin adenine dinucleotide, they show absorption around 450 and emission at 525 nanometers. In this case, contrary to NADH, oxidized form shows fluorescence than the reduced form. The typical lifetime of FAD and FMN is 2.3 and 4.7 nanoseconds respectively. The flavin fluorescence is quenched by adenosine due to complex formation and this is a static type of quenching. When bound to proteins, flavin are weakly fluorescent or non-fluorescent in contrast to NADH whose fluorescence increase when in bound form. Intensity of the fluorescence decays when bound to flavin in complex with multiple exponential decay time ranging from 0.1 to 5 nanoseconds. The mean decay time ranges from 0.3 to 1 nanosecond. Nucleotides and nucleic acids. This another class of intrinsic fluorophores. They are generally non-fluorescent in nature except the case of yeast tRNA. It contains highly fluorescent base known as Y base, the emission of which is at 470 nanometers and lifetime is near 6 nanoseconds. In addition to the fluorophores mentioned, there are other intact tissue fluorophores, for example, collagen, elastin, lipopigment, porphyrin. The emission in these is not due to the single molecular species, but represent all the emitting species present in that tissue. The emitting species may be due to cross links between oxidized lysine residue that results in hydroxypyridium group. At different wavelengths, different emission spectra are observed. That means when you change the wavelength of absorption, emission spectra will be changed. Extrinsic fluorophores. When molecules of interest are non-fluorescent in nature, 
external agents are added to obtain fluorescence for their study. For example, DNA and lipids are non-fluorescent in nature and external agents can be added which bind to them and produce fluorescence. Such molecules can be labeled by probes that show fluorescence. Sometimes proteins are also labeled with chromophores that excite at different wavelengths than the amino acids in proteins to study them in presence of other proteins. Use of fluorophores has increased dramatically during past decades to study the biomolecules. Protein labeling reagents. Large number of fluorophores have been used to label proteins and they can be covalent or non-covalent in nature. Covalent have reactive groups to react with amines, sulfur drill or histidine residues. Examples of widely used fluorophores include densyl chloride, 5-IFA, FITC, TRIC-TC, NBD chloride and acrylodan. Densyl chloride is one of the widest used fluorophore in biochemical research. It excites at 350 nanometer where proteins do not absorb and its emission maxima is very well in the visible range that is 520 nanometer. It can serve as an acceptor of fluorescence from proteins. Other reagents or fluorophores that have been used in protein labeling include fluorescein and rhodamine. Fluorescein and rhodamine are widely used because of their favorable long absorption maxima near 480 nanometers and emission wavelength in visible range of 510 nanometers. The rhodamine absorption maxima near 600 nanometer and emission wavelength at 650 nanometer. They are not affected by environment that is polarity of solvent like densyl chloride. They are also widely used because of their high extinction coefficient which is around 80,000 per mole per centimeter. Wide variety of reactive derivatives like iodoestamides, malamides, isothiocyanates have also been used as protein probes. Iodoestamides, melamides have used for labeling of sulfur drill group, whereas isothiocyanates, anhydroxysuccinamide, and sulfone chloride are used for labeling amines. Fluorescein and rhodamine are also used for labeling antibodies. Fluorescein and rhodamine labeled immunoglobulins are even commercially available for use in immunoassays. Now, why we say fluorescein and rhodamine? because they have few advantages over other fluorophores available. They have high quantum yield. That means almost most of the molecules which absorb energy release their energy in the form of emission. They have long absorption and emission wavelengths. The lifetime is near 4 nanoseconds. That is quite long enough to be recorded. They are non-sensitive to polarity of solvent and are suitable for quantifying the association of small labeled molecules with proteins by a change in fluorescence. But nothing comes without disadvantage. So fluorescein and rhodamine have disadvantages also. They have a tendency to self quench That means when the increase of the con increased concentration of fluorescein and rhodamine happens, they combine together and their fluorescence is decreased. So this may be because that fluorescein displays small stokes shift. So when more than one fluorescein groups are attached to a protein, energy transfer between the fluorescence group takes place. And this happens due to less distance between the two groups. It is less than 40 angstroms, a distance called foster distance. Number of other dyes have also been used as fluorophores because of the disadvantage with fluorescein and rhodamine. One of the very commonly used dye is BODP, which has replaced fluorescein and rhodamine. It is an unusual boron containing fluorophore and a wide range of emission wavelength can be obtained from 
body p from 510 to 675 nanometers it has high quantum yield and extinction coefficient of 80000 per mole per centimeter it is also sensitive to solvent polarity and ph therefore making it good for dynamic studies of the proteins also it has narrow emission peak resulting in more of light emission at peak wavelength but as others have some disadvantage biodp has also a disadvantage of having small stokes shift it has a foster distance of 57 angstroms and as a result energy transfer to each other and quenching happens at high concentration this slide shows you structure of some of the bodp dyes the one of bodp dyes bodp rg6 bodp 581 and 591 bodp trx this slide shows you a normalized fluorescein emission spectra of bodp dye in methanol large number of bodp dyes are available with different wavelength emissions the number 1 2 3 4 5 to 7 shows different bodp dyes available and their spectra and you can see the spectra shift is to the right that is the bethochromic shift is observed in addition to covalent probes used for protein study some dyes are available which are non covalent in nature and bind non covalently to proteins for example naphthyl amine sulfonic acids one anilino naphthalene 6 sulfonic acid and two para toledinyl naphthalene 6 sulfonic acids they are used as non covalent protein label probes they are weak or non fluorescent in water but when bound to protein or membrane they show strong fluorescence the structure of ans and tns is shown this slide shows you fluorescence emission spectra of bovine serum albumin in presence of increasing concentration of ans number indicates the number of ans molecules attached per bovine serum albumin molecule the excitation wavelength is 280 nanometers when we say fluorophore fluorophore means it produces light after absorbing light so that means it should be a compound which should be stable in presence of light that means it should not be destroyed or defunct in presence of light so photostability of fluorophores is an important aspect while selecting a fluorophore So most of the fluorophores bleach on continuous elimination that means their emission decreases fluorescence is one of the least stable fluorophore and compared to it elixa fluoro dyes are most stable fluorophores the emission spectra of elixa fluoro dye ranges from 442 to 775 nanometer in addition to the intrinsic property of the fluorophore the photostability is affected by number of other factors the external factors or you can say environmental factors but there is no general rule for example some fluorophores cause loss in fluorescence due to presence of oxygen and photostability decreases whereas in other cases there is no effect of the presence of oxygen this slide shows you a figure which is of comparison of photostability of labeled antibodies in cells fixed on slide so with increase in time we can see the decrease in fluorescence that means the fluorescence is diminishing so students let's summarize what we have learned in this module we discussed about the fluorophores what is the requirement for a chemical to be a fluorophore its definition characteristic of an ideal fluorophore how many types of fluorophores are there intrinsic and extrinsic fluorophores covalent non covalent type of fluorophores their use and advantage and disadvantage of some of the fluorophores and their photostability when they are exposed to light in the study 